evening. My name is Margarita Caulfield. I am a member of the Dolan Institute Student Advisory Board, and I would like to welcome you to tonight's program. On behalf of the Dole Institute, I have three requests. First, please turn off your cell phones. Also, we will have a Q&A session immediately after the program. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for a staffer to bring you the microphone. Finally, do ask a single question. Our director doesn't tolerate um, filibustering during questions. <laughs> it is my honor to introduce Associate Director Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Margarita, and good evening, and we would like to welcome you to Eisenhower 1956, the President's Year of Crisis, Suez, and the Brink of War with Dr. David Nichols. You have your bio in front of you, and I'll just hit just a few of the highlights. As you know, he's a leading authority on the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower. His 2007 book on President Eisenhower and Civil Rights entitled A Matter of Justice Eisenhower and the Beginning of the Civil War's Revolution is described as the definitive book on Eisenhower's civil rights policies. His new book on Suez uh, Canal Crisis entitled Eisenhower 1956, The Years of Crisis on Suez and the Brink of War. So we know that in terms of uh, talking with him just a few minutes ago, he indicated that you really do fall in love with your subject that you really get to know your subject. You may not like your subject all the time, but you do learn a lot about your subject. And I think when you read his books, you know that, that he has done that. I would also say that he is a former academic dean at Southwestern College in Winfield. That's his alma mater. A native of Kansas, he has a PhD in history from the College of William and Mary, and his dissertation Lincoln and the Indians, Civil War Policy and Politics was published by the University of Missouri Press in 1978, and Dr. Nichols and his wife Grace live in Winfield, Kansas. I also had the pleasure of sitting next to a very good friend of his, Bruce Williams, and I asked him quite a few questions, and I learned some things that you don't have uh, before you. You uh, will know that Dr. <laughs> Nichols, uh, are you getting nervous yet? Yeah. Uh, that Dr. Nichols. Yeah, he um, knows too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't tell me everything, but played um, the violin. Also, his friend, Bruce, plays the violin and the viola. So they have known each other for many, many years. Being a music major myself, when you say someone is a musician, you realize that as a musician, there's a, a certain uh, sense that you pay attention to, whether it's your note or the hearing or the feeling that you have for music. And a lot of that translates often to writing and getting to know who your subject really is. And I think that's probably why when you're looking at the books or reading them, you realize that his subject comes alive for you. You also know that the interstate system that we're on today, President Eisenhower was responsible for that. There's a lot of things he has done that he has not gotten credit for. And I'm sure you'll hear tonight what uh, many of those things are. We have a quote that was done um, on the LA Times book review. It says, Nichols, Eisenhower 1956, captures the president and the nation as both battled a series of difficulties, including the president's shaky health, his reelection, and a pair of overlapping foreign crises. The result is a riveting and relevant analysis mm -hmm. of a sequence of events that placed the great nations of the period at the brink of a world war. That we know so little about the clashes of 1956 is testament not to their unimportance, but to their death handling by a great American president. You will hear more about that this evening. I will simply just say to you, please look on the back and you will notice that we had a full summer schedule, more so than we have had before. We hope you will take advantage of the events we have because you certainly are invited as always to participate. With that, I turn the evening over to Bill Lacey, our director of the Dole Institute, and Dr. David Nichols, where you can learn even more about the president that you thought you knew everything about, but you find out you did not. 
Please welcome David Nichols. Dave, welcome back to the Dole Institute. You were here a few years ago to talk about your other book on Eisenhower. So it's glad an honor to be here again, Bill. It's great to have you back. Uh, the Suez Crisis occurred well over 50 years ago. Why did you choose to write about this story? Well, it was Susan Eisenhower, uh, uh, President Eisenhower's granddaughter, who first said to me that she thought this subject had really been neglected. And I knew about it in general terms. I knew that most diplomatic historians kind of treated it as the last gasp of colonialism. It wasn't treated as a major event of any particular kind, nor had Eisenhower gotten any particular credit for any great crisis leadership in it. And so uh, the American literature, there were good British studies on it, but the American literature on it was, was, was very thin. The last major book on the Suez Crisis by an American uh, journalist, uh, Donald Neff, was published in 1981. That was before most of the de documents relative to that crisis were declassified. So I was able to have hundreds of declassified documents to, to study in this, this new study uh, of this. And so it had been, it had been neglected, but uh, Susan Eisenhower I, I traced to, and, and she was right, it had been neglected, and uh, I'm so glad I got into it. When you and I <laughs> talked about tonight, and we talked about really wanting to focus on this particular story and its importance. Uh, you really emphasized to me the importance of kind of setting the stage for it. So take a few minutes, take however much time you need, and kind of describe the stage that this crisis kind of came into. Okay, there's, there's kind of three dramas that, that, that I usually sketch out that kind of set the stage for the Suez crisis. And the first one, the first drama starts, as you would expect, with Ike on the golf course. Uh, he was on the golf course in Colorado on September 23rd, 1955. And uh, he got four phone calls on playing golf that day. And this irritated him greatly because this was before cell phones, you know. So he had to go back to the clubhouse to get each call. And three of the four calls didn't get through. The fourth one was from John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, this was an important call, because in that call he confirmed to Eisenhower that the Soviet Union had completed an arms deal with Egypt. This was an attempt of the Soviet Union to change the balance of power in the Middle East. It was a very serious matter, and Eisenhower uh, and Dulles agreed they need to send a message to Nikolai Bolganin, the Soviet premier, and, and Ike said he wanted to think about that overnight, and, and he said, I'll call you in the morning. That phone call was never made. Because Eisenhower went back to his game, but his game deteriorated. He began to be uncomfortable as the day went on. He didn't have much appetite for dinner. He usually had a drink at night before going to bed. He declined that drink. He went to bed, and in the middle of the morning, he shows up at Mamie's bedside and says, I have a pain across the lower part of my chest. And she calls Howard Snyder, his physician. Snyder comes over. This is a long story. I tell everybody, if you want to know how this was handled medically, you got to read the book, because I'm not going to take time to get into it. But Howard Snyder initially put out the word that Eisenhower had, had a digestive upset. And he knew very well, in short order, that he'd had a massive heart attack. And and still, Snyder did not call an ambulance. They finally took him, took Eisenhower to Fort Simmons, Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver, but they had him walk from the house to the car, not in an ambulance. And this is a whole story that, that uh, an extraordinary story. But the, the, the important part of it is Eisenhower was in the hospital for six weeks. And in those days, the gold standard for heart treatment was total bed rest. And so they would not let him read a newspaper. They would not let him watch a movie. The doctors would not permit him to listen to a football game on the radio, let alone do much serious presidential business. He did not take a step across the room for a month. And those of you, I'll bet there are people in this audience who've had heart treatment. Uh, th that's not what they would do now. Well, they'd have you up walking the next day, probably. But in those days, that's what it was. And so he was out of commission. 
Dwight Eisenhower was out of the White House for three and a half months, except for two nights that he stayed there on his way to finish his recuperation in Gettysburg, but he didn't return. Remember, this was September 23rd, 24th, 1955. He goes back to the White House on January 8th, full time. And so he's out of commission at the very time when the first major American crisis in the Middle East takes place. And so uh, that's, the, that, the, that's the first drama. Drama number two related to his health is whether I could run for a second term in 1956 or not. Now, I think he always intended to run, Bill. I, I'm convinced of that. People argue about it. I'm convinced he always intended to run. This is the age of Roosevelt. You weren't going to be a great president by not running for a second term. I mean, you, you would do that. I think he always intended to run. The question was physically, could he run? And this, they wouldn't let him do much of anything else, so he could spend time agonizing about this, and he went through with, with all, various of his aides, all the people in his administration who might succeed him. And he trot them all out, and of course, everyone he looked at and mentioned, I won't go through all the names and mention it, not one of them had a snowball's chance in hell of getting nominated, let alone getting elected, except one. And that one was Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Eisenhower poured cold water on that prospect altogether, and if you want to know why, you have to read my other book, <laughs> on, on, on Eisenhower and civil rights, because there's a whole chapter on Ike and, and Warren in that, and they, uh, they were political rivals in a way that's explained in that. So Eisenhower eventually convinces himself that he's going to be healthier serving than he is retiring. And that goes against the advice from his brother, Milton, and from his son, John. We don't know exactly where Mamie was on all this. She seemed to support whatever he decided he was going to do. That was pretty private between them. And so eventually, he gets clearance from the doctors. This is a whole interesting story. I mean, he, he has what I think is a sham physical exam on, on February 14th, 1956. But anyway, finally, on February 29th, 1956, he announces he will run for a second term, much too late for anybody else to gear up to do a presidential campaign. So that's drama number two. Drama number three, though, is the main one for our consideration tonight. And that has to do with the Aswan Dam. That's A-S-W-A-N, the Aswan Dam. This was President Nasser of Egypt's great dream to harness the Nile River for Egyptian agriculture and electricity to bring Egypt into the modern age. And that he built his prestige around that. And, and, uh, and so the, it's much too long to get into this, but Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles had a plan called the Alpha Plan that they proposed for resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. And as you know, nobody still resolved it, but they made a plan. It was a plan that sounds like a modern plan. It talked about the borders. It talked about the refugees. It talked about the holy places in Israel. And John Foster Dulles presented that to the Council of Foreign Relations in New York on August 26, 1955. But, and part of that plan was aid to the Aswan Dam as a carrot to get Egypt to make peace with Israel. Well, the Alpha Plan was dead on arrival, as every Mideast peace plan has been. And by the way, if you want to pick on Eisenhower about that, I mean, tell me who's been successful yet. Uh, but, but, but it was dead on arrival. But Eisenhower, in December of 55, when he began to get back into the swim of, of policy stuff, convinced the National Security Council that the United States should still provide some aid to the Aswan Dam, partly to keep the Soviet Union from doing it because they were toying with doing it. And so they do make a commitment in December of 1955 to give aid to the Aswan Dam to the Egyptians. Those negotiations go on in the early in the next year, but Ike doesn't pay much attention to them because he's concentrating on deciding to run or not to run, and on after he decides to run to campaign, and he stays rather disengaged from it. Those negotiations kind of broke down as the months went on. But then on June 7th, uh, maybe I'm getting farther than you want to get into this. Is that okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. June 7th, 56. Okay, Ike has decided to run. Remember, we said he, he announced on February 29th. The Uni United States have been negotiating with the Egyptians about Aswan. Um, and, 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 and the arms had been delivered to Egypt, and so you have this whole you know, turmoil kind of situation. 
On June 7th, 1956, Ike appears to be fully recovered from his heart attack. He has 15 appointments that day, does a lot of meetings, goes to the White House photographer's dinner and laughs at uh, Bob Hope's jokes, and, and comes home at midnight, delivers uh, uh, Howard Snyder, his physician, to Snyder's home, and goes back to the White House, goes to bed immediately. Howard Snyder is just taking off his clothes, getting ready to go to bed when the phone rings. And he records in his diary that he reached for the phone with a shutter because he knew only that the first lady could be calling at this hour. And he rushed over to see the president. Now, I could always had digestive problems. And so a, a, a late night visit by the physician to the president's bed was not uncommon. And so he went again, but scared to death that this was another heart attack because Ike had horrendous pain across his abdomen. It was just an awful pain. And, and uh, uh, eventually uh, they figured out that this was an intestinal blockage. It was in a blockage in the, in the small intestine that they called ileitis. And, and Obviously, he was going to have to have surgery. This is another medical drama. I'm sorry if you want to know more about it, you've got to read the book. Uh, another medical drama I don't take, but 13 doctors took hour after hour to decide what to do because they didn't want to stick a knife in a president who'd had a heart attack eight months earlier. And they didn't until this, you know, this was started up in the middle of the, of the night, June 7th. Finally, at 2 a.m. on June 9th, they wheel him in for surgery, and Howard Snyder, his physician, said if the patient had been plain Mrs. Murphy, they would have operated many hours before. Uh, it, how close the president came to being killed by both of the management of both these illnesses is, is truly remarkable. So, this is now back to Aswan, because the negotiations with the Egyptians have been breaking down for a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to take your time now. They, they, the United States was not willing to make loans and take cotton in return and all that kind of thing, and so it was not going well. But more important, in the Congress, there was a big fight over foreign aid, and the Congress was not in favor of it, and they would realized that the administration was bearing aid to the Aswan Dam in the foreign aid bill, and key congressional leaders, senators, were against that, and John Foster knew they were, Foster Dulles, they knew they were against it. And so, I mean, Ike is out of commission again for weeks, just when all this is heating up. So that's kind of the backdrop for the, you, shall I go ahead or? Well, I, I, was, gonna, I was gonna just insert here that uh, you may have noticed as you came in that we're selling Dave's book out there, so you can all <laughs> fill in the details by picking up a copy, which he's promised to sign all that we sell tonight. But uh, talk a little bit about what happens in July of 56 that kind of lights the fuse. Well, Eisenhower comes back to the White House on July 15th. Remember, the, the, the crisis with the Eliadis was on June 7th. Comes back on July 15th. He's not in good shape. He's depressed. Uh, we don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a medical historian, so I didn't dig into this as much as maybe I could have, whether it was a result of medication or what. But he has bouts of depression, even when he's back in the White House. He still has a surgical bag attached, he's, he, people described him as being bent over and, and looking like he was in pain, and he looked even worse than he did after the heart attack. He's back in the 15th. On the 19th, the Egyptian foreign minister is coming to see John Foster Dulles to finally decide what's gonna happen on the Aswan Dam, four days later. That morning, John Foster Dulles, after the NSC meeting, National Security Council meeting, has a 12-minute meeting with the president. And in that meeting, he tells the president, if we don't withdraw the offer of aid to the Aswan Dam, the Congress is going to. And we need to beat them to it. And, and he thinks politically we need to beat them to it rather than have them withdraw it. It was a Democratic Congress, and so anyway. And Eisenhower agrees. Ike was not really on top of this issue at this point. He acquiesced. He hadn't, he hadn't been plugged into it enough. He couldn't pull the plug on what Dulles was going to do at this point, and he didn't. And he's responsible for that. So Dulles meets with the ambassador that afternoon, 
and withdraws the offer of aid, pretty well insults the ambassador because he's saying that, he, that, that their judgment is that the Egyptian people would hate whoever provided the aid because of the austerity that would be forced on them to build the dam, and that really upset Nasser in particular, and, and issues a press release, and Dulles takes off for, for South America. Uh, the reaction in Egypt is remarkable. Uh, the CIA, we could talk a lot about CIA not doing what they needed to do. They didn't understand what was going to happen. They didn't figure it out. Nobody did. And, and a week later, on July 26th, 1956, Gamal Abdel Nasser did a big fiery speech in which he announced he was nationalizing the Suez Canal Company. The, the company, the Suez Canal Company that ran the Suez Canal had been controlled by the British and the French for decades. And two-thirds of the oil for Western Europe came through the canal at that time. And so the British and French were ready to go to war. Now, this, this, this was something they felt like they could not tolerate. And uh, the good news is Eisenhower snapped out of his post-surgical doldrums and grabbed hold of this. Dulles was in South America, and he saw that war was coming. He had made up his mind a long time ago that war, that, 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 that it, it, there's so much background, Bill, that I probably shouldn't get into. Eisenhower persuaded the Brit or tried to persuade the British and French from the time he came into office that colonialism was over and done. They should get rid of it, that they should bury it and move on. And uh, at the time he came into office, there were 80,000 British troops in the, in the Suez Canal Zone. And he convinced them to negotiate to remove those troops. Interestingly enough, when they were out of it, they were all gone about a month before Nasser nationalized the canal, which probably facilitated that. And so he had, he, you know, his attorney general told him that he thought it was legal for Egypt to nationalize the canal. The canal was completely within Egyptian territory. And I quickly said to the British and French, Look, it doesn't matter who owns the canal. The question is, do you, are you going to have access to it, and is it going to be well run? And so he and Dulles, uh, Dulles came back, and Dulles went to, to, to London to negotiate with. So he and the British and French ne negotiated for three months. And, and uh, you know, threats to go to war were constant. And they sent delegations to see Nasser, and that didn't work out. And so throughout August and September and most of October, there were attempts to negotiate a peaceful solution. There are all kinds of complicated solutions that are in the book, including a Su users association. They invented uh, uh, what they call the Suez Canal Users Association, SCUA for short, that was kind of like a, a union that would negotiate the fees and the fees, you know, that, that, that the money wouldn't go to the Egyptians unless they played ball and all that kind of stuff. None of it worked. None of it worked out. But Eisenhower was adamant that they could not go to war over this. He had made up his mind. So, you want me to roll on and keep going? No. This is your show. Okay. All right. No, no. I don't. I, I see at least ten questions on your sheet there. No. So I don't want to. No, we're doing great. Okay. Well, then we get into the crisis because uh, in September, late September, early October, the British and French decide that they can't get Eisenhower to help them. And they start being duplicitous with him. They start plotting together with the Israelis. And that plotting is going forward very rapidly by mid-October until October 24th, 1956, in a villa outside Paris in a secret meeting CIA didn't figure it out, even though they had people close to it, they didn't figure it out. The British, French, well, to be specific, Christian Pinot, the French foreign minister, uh, David Ben-Gurion, the Israeli prime minister, and Pat, Sir Patrick Dean, the deputy undersecretary of state for Great Britain, met and signed a secret protocol to attack Egypt. The plan was this. Israel would attack Egypt across the Sinai Peninsula. The British and French would then issue an ultimatum, pretending they were trying to make peace, issue an ultimatum to the two sides to cease fire, withdraw from the Suez Canal Zone, 
and accept British French occupation of the canal zone. If, if the ultimatum were denied as they expected by the Egyptians, if they would not accept it, they would begin bombing the, the Egyptians and, and, and launch the war full scale. And so uh, that happened on October 24th, 1956 in Paris. Secret meeting. Eisenhower didn't know anything about it. They didn't consult him about it. They didn't tell him about it. The big news in the paper that day was that the Soviet Union had sent some troops <coughs> into Budapest, troops and tanks into Budapest, Hungary, where there was a revolt going on, and it killed a number of demonstrators. This isn't the big invasion, but it was the one that happened leading up to that one that some of you know about the big invasion later. But that was what was in the news. This meeting was not in the news. So Eisenhower and Dulles knew that there were things happening. They saw soldiers being gathered at Cyprus and Malta. They knew the Israelis had engaged in a mobilization. They were fearful all along that there might be a war launched, but as late as April, October 28th, they didn't think it was going to happen right away. Well, on October 29th, Eisenhower is campaigning in Florida, and he gets ready to board his plane for Richmond, Virginia for his last appearance on that campaign swing and he's handed a note, and the note tells him that the Israelis have invaded Egypt and have marched already within 25 miles of the Suez Canal. And Eisenhower flies back to the White House, meets with John Foster Dulles. If you don't mind me quoting him accurately, I, I will. He says to Dulles, send a message to the Israelis, and God damn it, tell them we're going to do, use sanctions, we're going to go to the UN, we're going to do everything we can do to stop this thing from happening. He was furious. He did not know at that moment that the British and French were going to come in, but he was afraid they would because if oil quit coming through the Suez Canal, if Nasser blocked it, he, he believed they would, and he said that would open a, up a great rift between us. And Ike said to Dulles, I don't really care in the slightest whether I get reelected or not. We've got to fix this. Well, the next day, October 30th, the, the, the British and French implemented the plot. <coughs> they issued a 12-hour ultimatum. It was impossible to do anything in 12 hours, but they issued one anyway, an ultimatum, that, they, that asking the parties to withdraw within 10 miles away from the Suez Canal and accept occupation of the Suez Canal. and. Um, and they assumed, this is the great, you see, Eisenhower decided immediately he was not going to support the Allies. He decided then on October 29th. He'd really already decided it. But the Allies thought, the, these World War II Allies, remember, the, he was their supreme Allied commander in World War II. They thought once they got into the thick of the fight, he would not desert them. And boy, were they wrong. And he said to one of his aides, those who began this operation can boil in their own oil and when they were talking about providing oil to them if they needed it. He was not going to do it and, and insisted not. And so suddenly they found themselves out on that limb. And, uh, but meanwhile, the bombing started on October 31st after the, after the ultimatum expired. And, and, uh, and, and a huge armada, the biggest armada seen in the Mediterranean since World War II, British and French ships with paratroopers were steaming toward Egypt. And, and um, uh, you know, October 31st was a little bit hopeful for Eisenhower on one front. At least the, the Soviet Union kind of pulled back from Budapest and announced that they were going to try to practice equality with the satellites. It was a confusing kind of statement out of them. This was part of, really part of, for those of you interested in the Soviet Union, part of the power struggle going on in the Soviet Union where Khrushchev had not yet consolidated his power fully and is part of what was going on there at the time, but uh, we won't get into that too much. But bombs were falling and, and you know, planes on, on an Egyptian airfields air were being turned into burning smoking wreckage. Communication centers were being taken out. Nasser sunk a 320-foot ship in the Suez Canal filled with rocks and cement. They eventually uh, he eventually uh, scuttled another 32 ships in the canal, and uh, Eisenhower that night, this is the 31st, decided he must address the nation. 
and, and he planned to do a, a televised address to the nation. John Foster Dulles, uh, who we now know was a very sick man, uh, tried to write a draft of that speech. And, and he took it to the president mid-afternoon, and Ike read it over and thought it was horrible. It was a terrible speech, and he ordered that a brand new speech be written, this time not by Dulles. And so literally, moments before the television cameras were ready to roll, speechwriter uh, 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 Emmett Hughes was handing pages of the speech to the president across the table. It was a terse, short speech in which he made clear to the American people that the United States had not been consulted or informed about this action in the Middle East. And uh, 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 he, he said plainly, and I quote, there will be no United States involvement in these present hostilities. November 1st was, Ann Whitman, his secretary, said another day of great crises. Sherman Adams, his uh, chief of staff, said that he didn't remember a, a week in the entire Eisenhower presidency that was more stressful for the president than this one in all the years he worked with him. And, and uh, there were rumors that the Soviet Union might, might deploy aircraft on Syrian bases. Ike asked the, chief, the, the chair of the Joint Chiefs whether the Soviets could have, have slipped, that was his word, some atom bombs to the Egyptians. It was just all those kind of worries. He canceled the rest of his campaign speeches except for Philadelphia that night of November 1. And uh, uh, what he said in that speech, uh, he went to, he went to his convention hall in Philadelphia and there were 18,000 partisans expecting a big campaign speech. And Eisenhower, instead, the reporter said, did a speech that was kind of the speech for, for all of the nation, the president of all the country. And this wonderful quotation I'll, I'll share with you. Well, he said they, that the administration had pursued what he thought was the path of honor of not intervening in Egypt or in Hungary, of opposing war in both cases. But he said, we cannot and will not condone armed aggression, no matter who the attacker and no matter who the victim. We cannot, in the world any more than in our own nation, subscribe to one law for the weak, another law for the strong, one law for those opposing us, another for those allied with us. There can be only one law or there will be no peace. We believe, he went on, that the power of modern weapons makes war not only perilous, but preposterous. And the only way to win World War III is to prevent it. Um, the morning of November 2nd, I'm probably taking too long with this. The, 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 I'll, I'll see if I can summarize quickly. The General Assembly, Eisenhower said in that speech, he, he was, the, the, the British and French had vetoed a resolution for a ceasefire in the, night, in the UN Security Council. So Eisenhower took the unprecedented step of taking it to the General Assembly. And in the morning at 4 a.m. on November 2nd, the General Assembly passed that resolution 64 to 5. Uh, uh, and, and, and the Democrats were really attacking. Uh, L.A. Stevenson said, we've alienated our chief and our ancient strongest allies. We've alienated Israel. We've alienated Egypt and the Arab countries. Uh, in the United Nations, our main associate in Middle Eastern matters now is the Soviet Union. Uh, Stevenson ended up saying, I doubt if ever before in our diplomatic history has any policy been such an abysmal, such a complete, and such a catastrophic failure. Uh, uh, Ike was not sleeping well by this point. Um, his blood pressure was uh, elevated, uh, volatile. Uh, his heart was skipping beats. He had uh, uh, almost daily diarrhea. I told, uh, I told a staff member at the, um, at the Eisenhower Library one time, the records are so good there that, that uh, getting daily reports on the president's diarrhea was almost more information <laughs> <laughs> than I really wanted to have. Uh, uh, and, and he... Um, uh, but after that November 1st speech, uh, going back on, on the train to Union Station in Washington, D.C., uh, Ike had uh, two scotches before dinner and three after dinner. Very unusual for him. He was not an alcoholic. But this was of enormous stress on a man who'd had a very serious health issues during the year. And then the night of November 2nd, 
John Foster Dulles is rushed to Walter Reed Hospital where he has surgery for a tumor, a cancerous tumor in his colon. On November 3rd, the news is not only about Dulles, but the Syrians have blown, blown up their pipe, oil pipelines. The Egyptian Air Force is destroyed on the ground. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt attacks the administration for supporting the Kremlin and, and, and Egypt, an Egyptian dictator against our oldest, strongest allies. Six members of the Democratic, uh, uh, six members, six Democratic senators of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee attack what Eisenhower is doing and say they agree with Roosevelt and with Eli Stevenson and they say that the administration of Eisenhower has been featured by quote four years of indecision, tactlessness, timidity, and bluster. And Stevenson that night, I won't quote it to you, but he talks about the president's health and he says that the president's health obviously indicates that the most important person in the next administration will be Richard Nixon because the president can't possibly survive. This is a real tough speech. Uh, I won't bother to read the, the quotation to you, but he, he was saying, it, it, as it turns out, you know, uh, years later, Eisenhower outlived Stevenson, but, but uh, we, won't, we won't go there. Uh, November 4th, though, is the perfect storm. November 4th, 1956. Because at 4 a.m. in the morning, the Soviet Union sends 200,000 troops and 4,000 tanks into Hungary. And tens of thousands of Hungarians die that day. Eisenhower quickly decides that the United States is in no position to intervene. His allies are tied down in Egypt. Yeah, Hungary's not, not accessible by sea. They could not attack uh, by air or with troops without violating neutral countries. And he concluded the only thing they could do is help with the refugees, something for which he's been roundly criticized. On, on, uh, meanwhile, in, Hungary, in, in the Middle East, Israel now is, uh, holds the Sinai and Gaza and 5,000 Egyptian prisoners. On November 5th, British and French paratroopers finally land in Egypt. And the Egyptian forces begin to surrender. And right in the middle of this, the Soviet Union throws fire on this, throws fuel on this international fire by sending threatening messages to Britain, France, and Israel, saying if they don't cease the war, the, the Soviet Union would be prepared to use force to end it. And Bulganin, the Soviet Premier, sends a message to Eisenhower proposing that they, they jointly use their naval forces to militarily intervene and end the war in Egypt. Eisenhower treats this proposal as, well, his favorite word is unthinkable. This is unthinkable. General Assembly had already passed a resolution. He, he saw it as an ultimatum and issued a strong statement saying that the, if the Soviet Union attempted to let, unilaterally intervene, it would be forcibly opposed by the United States and the United Nations. And um, he drew a, a line in effect in the Middle East sand. Uh, 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 that evening, uh, by the way, he was still in bad shape. He, um, his, his doctor records that he um, had a headache and had eaten only a dish of carrots and some yogurt since breakfast, tried to lie down for a while. This is, this is election eve, by the way. The, the election's the next day. This is election eve. Tries to lie down for a while. Uh, uh, isn't successful in taking a nap of any kind. And he's, he's mumbling, I'm sure, with typical Eisenhower profanity to his doctor, the doctor records in his diary that he said if he were a dictator, he'd just gotten his ultimatum from Bulganin, and that if he were a dictator, he'd tell the Russians if they were going to move a finger, he'd drop their whole, our whole entire stock of atom bombs on it. But of course, he wasn't a dictator, and he wasn't about to do that. But it was a bad scene. He put, uh, for the military folks, in the, 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 there are all kinds of details about how he put American forces on alert after those messages not only in the Mediterranean, but in the Atlantic and Pacific, all kinds of alert signals went out. Those forces remained on alert through most of November, and, and they were on alert against the Soviet Union, not against the British and French. Then November 6th is election day, and uh, Ike has a meeting the first time in the morning, first thing in the morning before he and Mamie are gonna go to vote in Gettysburg, uh, 
And he says our people should be alert because he noted that if the Soviets uh, deployed planes, aircraft, and Syrian bases, the British and French would bomb those bases. And then, as he said, the fat, fat would be in the fire. And, but he and Mamie did go off and vote, but the White House staff got so worried after he left that they almost had him turn around and come back. They did fly him back. Instead of driving him back, they'd driven to Gettysburg. And, and because they had intelligence from Moscow, from Chip Boland, the ambassador, that the Soviet Union was getting ready to take more serious action, they were worried. And so things appeared to be much worse. And at 12.38 p.m. that noon, Eisenhower walked back into the White House after a briefing met in the cabinet room with 18 men, the top leaders of the defense and state departments, including the Joint Chiefs. And the Joint Chiefs presented all the steps for readiness for a major war with the Soviet Union that, that uh, could be taken. And Eisenhower went through those steps, step by step by step by step, and, and, and okayed most of them. And uh, in the middle of that meeting, he got a phone call. Do you, I'm really babbling on a long ways. Are you, are you okay? I'm great. Go ahead and finish <laughs> it. <laughs> well, I, we, 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 we will have to this break this off in just a few minutes so we can open for Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I think we can do that rather quickly. The, uh, you, you, we could stop now, and it'd be a real cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> That'd really make them yeah. buy the book, wouldn't it? No, you go ahead. Except they know what happened. Okay. Yes. Okay, I guess I better tell them. So in the middle of this meeting, he gets a phone call, and, and, and it's a transatlantic phone call from Anthony Eden, the British Prime Minister, who confirms, Eisenhower had some hints before, but confirms that the British have agreed on a ceasefire. Now, we can get into Q&A about why that happened, why after all this preparation, they agreed to a ceasefire. It was a very tense conversation. Again, I, I can't get into it in depth, but if you read the book, the conversation is very interesting between, because we have transcripts of this phone conversation, and between a, a, an angry, tense Anthony Eden, resentful to some extent. And, and, and Eisenhower immediately asked him if it's a ceasefire without conditions. And, and, and Eden says, kind of spits out the words and said, unless we're attacked. And, and Eisenhower brings up the technical troops, because the British had technical troops that could clear the canal. And he immediately said to, to, to Eden, he said, I don't think you should use your technical troops. You should you put them at the disposal of Doc Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the UN. And in terms of a UN peacekeeping force they were hoping to put together, there shouldn't be any of the great powers in it, including the British and French. Eisenhower was at his best at this. He would figured out all the ways that Eden might try to get a de facto occupation of the canal zone, because if they used the technical troops to clear the canal zone, then they'd be there, wouldn't they? And he wasn't about to let that happen. And so uh, this was tense, but, but, they, they, but they got the ceasefire. But the crisis was really hardly over, but uh, that's another story. This is, this is the major watershed, and I think that's maybe a good point to stop and do some other things, Bill. Okay, that's great, Dad. It's a fascinating, compelling story. Let's open to your Q&A. Uh, we have uh, Lexi, who's got a mic? Kristen has a mic. So raise your hand, so somebody will bring a mic to you. That was thorough, but I can't believe nobody has a question. There we go. There's no such thing as a dumb question in my classroom, so how about oh. Hello. Um, <laughs> later on, uh, Vice President Nixon, who was president, he had some kind of agreement with uh, was it, was it still Nasser, about uh, getting mis Soviet missiles out of Egypt. And then there was an agreement, I think with, with Jimmy Carter, uh, something else had to do with Egypt and, and Israel. Okay, um, how, if things would, if Eisenhower would have done things differently back in 56, like you're talking about, uh, would Nixon and Carter not have been able to have done what they did, or, or could they have done something different, or? You know, how did that all work out? I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't pretend to be knowledgeable about the two episodes you're talking about with Nixon and Carter. I, I really can't help you with that very much. I can talk about the implications of what Eisenhower did. Eisenhower <coughs> uh, uh, saved Nasser. There's no question. If Eisenhower had joined with the Allies, Nasser would have been toast. 
you know, his regime would have fallen. What they would have done with Egypt is an interesting thing to speculate about, but they, they you know, he would not have survived. He did survive. And, and, and in that sense, Eisenhower came to the defense of Arab nationalism, I think you could say. Having said that, he also opened the door to the rule by military strongmen in the Middle East. And, you know, uh, Hosni Mubarak was a 28-year-old uh, Air Force officer at the time of the Suez Canal crisis and on, his ri on a rise. And so Nasser is succeeded by Sadat, who makes some peace with, with Israel, who is succeeded by Mubarak. And you know where he finally ended up. And so um, that, the, the, the Eisenhower, Eisenhower's intervention, and, and I can talk in a moment about the Eisenhower Doctrine, but what Eisenhower did was, in effect, have the United States replace the British and French as the guarantors of security and stability in the Middle East. And so help me, that's still our policy that sits on Mr. Obama's desk. And in that sense, that, 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 that pattern that you described is part of that, but I'm sorry, I'm not knowledgeable about those two episodes. The question, we have a question right here. Wait for the mic, please. There we go. What were the forces that were working for him to select Nixon as his VP, and was he in favor of Nixon being his VP, or were there other forces? Are you talking about 1952, particularly? Yes. yes. Um, he, he, he didn't know Nixon well. Um, uh, Herbert Brownell, his, uh, who, the, who became his attorney general and who helped manage uh, managed his campaign significantly, was a major one pushing Nixon. And so it was a political matter that it wasn't, Eisenhower accepted him and, and, uh, and was enthusiastic about him, didn't know him well, though, before the convention, so it was a convention and political process as I understand it. I don't pretend to be, I haven't done deep research on that campaign and how that was done. I know quite a bit about keeping Nixon for the second term. There's a lot of mythology around that Eisenhower and Nixon didn't get along and Eisenhower didn't want to keep him. That's all garbage. That's not true. Ike would have never kept him. What you have to understand about Dwight Eisenhower is he was his own man. He did what he wanted to do. and. He did put, as we, some of us discussed over dinner, he used a lot of people as lightning rods. It's where John Foster Dulles was always out on the proverbial limb. So was, was his attorney general. So was uh, Charlie Wilson, the Secretary of Defense. Eisenhower was a very good politician in some ways. Uh, you know, he, he, while he wasn't a professional politician, he would protect his image, and if there were a hot issue, he'd let one of them take it. And so Nixon was a political surrogate for him in many regards and did what Eisenhower asked him to do. And so, for example, in the Suez crisis, then when Eisenhower quit campaigning, he sent Nixon out to take his campaign speeches. And he was, uh, Nixon was very effective uh, as vice president in working with, with con 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 in Congress. And uh, so the whole thing about, uh, if, if behind your question is, did Ike really like Nixon or not? Answer is yes, he did. He came to have some affection for him, I think, and su was supportive of him. And I don't think in 1952, I can't speak with any authority on that. Good question, right here. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Um, your comments seem to indicate that uh, Eisenhower was not very well served by the CIA during the Suez crisis. Uh, was, was there a weakness in our intelligence uh, gathering uh, during that time? Well, again, I'm not, I'm not a historian of American intelligence, but where it intersects my story, certainly uh, there are two things they failed on, absolutely. One is to anybody to predict, and I've seen the reports, that, that the reports they did, including the Intelligence Advisory Committee that Alan Dulles chaired. They did not foresee, none of them did, that Nasser might nationalize the Suez Canal. And it seems obvious in, in, in retrospect that that was a possibility, but nobody seemed to think of it. It's just not there. The other is that they missed that really is extraordinary is this secret meeting in Paris, this, 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 this plot, this conspiracy among the allies with Israel, and they missed it completely. Uh, Sir Patrick Dean, uh, one of the CIA agents, Agent uh, was a, a very close friend of Sir Patrick Deans and, and, and served with him on a British committee and didn't know, and Deans the one who signed that protocol and they just missed it all together. So those two examples make me think that they were not very well served. But uh, 
intelligence agencies, you know, their, their, their successes usually are never apparent. Uh, Osama bin Laden is a, uh, an example otherwise, but you know, they succeed at a lot of things you never see, but you see their failures, and uh, that's always true. Is there another hand right here? Do this, and then let's get one right up here, Chris, in the front row. Uh, doc, Dr. Nichols, could you tell us a little bit about the secret Bob Anderson mission earlier in 1956 to the Middle East and perhaps speculate as to why Eisenhower sent Anderson, who was not then in the government, in, in lieu of, of Dulles or, or one of the more traditional diplomatic channels? Well, Bob Anderson was a favorite of Ike's. He liked him. When he was talking about people who might succeed him in the presidency, he plainly said that he, he would be happy to see Anderson succeed him. A lot of the rest of us are never sure why on that. Uh, he was a Texas oil man. He had strong relationships with the Saudis in particular and, and uh, strong relationships in the Middle East. And so he sent them to see if they could resurrect, in effect, the Alpha Plan, this, this peace plan, and see if they could put it back together. Uh, and he spent a lot of time with Nasser and with David Ben-Gurion and found that both parties really didn't want to make peace in that way. So it, the, the Anderson mission was a great failure. But just why I chose Anderson, I don't know specifically. I don't have anything quoting him on that. But he liked Anderson. He always did. He'd been his secretary of the Navy. He eventually uh, uh, served him otherwise, and, and he just always liked him. And so Eisenhower was very cold-blooded about the people he used, but he had certain folks who were kind of cronies that he liked to use. But as a Texas oil man, I, I'm not sure uh, Middle East experts would tell you that, that Anderson wasn't viewed that positively by people in the Middle East. But uh, I, I, again, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, we have a question right here. Yes, I wonder if you could speak a bit to the, the process by which the British were prompted to agree to a ceasefire. Well, there are three or four reasons. Um, one is the Soviet threats played a role. I think that's undeniable, and, and some American historians want to kind of wave that off and say, well, that wasn't it. But, but the, the, you know, the possibility of the Soviet Union intervening is major. Um, uh, the, just the shortage of oil, you know, the, the Suez Canal, as I said, two-thirds of the oil for Western Europe came through the Suez Canal. It was no longer working. The Syrian pipelines were destroyed. The, the Saudi Arabian pipeline was still going, but they were in trouble in terms of having fuel to continue fighting and continue anything. You have to remember, this is only 11 years after World War II. Their economies were in terrible shape. And so the third thing is the financial end. And there was a great run on the pound. And some British folks still think that, uh, that Eisenhower and, and uh, uh, George Humphrey engineered that run on the pound. I, the av evidence for that is, is circumstantial at best. But they certainly didn't rescue them. So the financial issue may have been the major one, but of course, I would tell you, above all, Eisenhower's opposition, that, that ultimately they couldn't make it. They were gambling that Ike would join them, and he didn't. And not only didn't, after the ceasefire, he, and they, they initially would not withdraw their troops from, from Egypt, and Eisenhower refused to provide oil or financial aid to them until they made a public commitment to do it. And uh, it, it, was, it was really high-pressure stuff. The cabbies in, in Paris wouldn't pick up Americans, and, and, and fuel stations wouldn't sell gasoline to Americans, and it got really tough before they finally gave in on that. But, but he was tough on it. So I think Eisenhower's opposition was critical, but there are three or four factors like that. Thank you. Good question. I have a question right here. Kevin. Oh, your, your book is about Eisenhower. Uh, but the person who kind of emerged from the Suez Crisis as the hero of diplomacy was Lester Pearson of Canada, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and so forth. But I just wondered, you, you don't say much about Pearson in the book, and I'm just wondering what you think his role was in all this. Well, that's probably because I don't spend as much time as I should have on the United Nations. Uh, Pearson was, the Canadians did carry the water on the resolution, uh, the resolution that passed 64 to 5, for the ceasefire, and the Canadians did yeoman duty on that. And Lester Pearson, I remember one, one account where they were talking about uh, uh, what they were going to do to get a ceasefire, and about Pearson being in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Canada with his pencil in the air ready to sign the, the order to, to go and do it. Uh, 
So he did play a major role. I, I'm sorry, I didn't run into him that much in terms of Eisenhower's deliberations, and so that's the limit of what I do, and it is limited. I try very hard to look over Eisenhower's shoulder and say what was working with him, and, uh, and so I think the negotiations with Pearson and, and the Canadians were primarily with John Foster Dulles. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Okay. Uh, Exxon Dam discussion. Uh, John Foster Dulles canceled the sponsorship. And I thought in your book, perhaps you danced a little bit about the responsibility that Foster Dulles carried toward a negative response. Uh, is that true, or did you, did, was he really against it, or was it uh, an opportunity to uh, turn something down? You talking about the ass one? Yeah. Decision. Yeah. Oh, I think he wanted to get rid of it. I think he thought it was a bad deal. Yeah. yeah, he thought it was a bad deal, and he thought the Congress were going to do it anyway, and so he wanted to, I think, take credit for it. I don't think, uh, if, I, if I danced around it, I'm, I'm sorry, because I think he did not do well with this. He did not handle it well. Eisenhower didn't think he handled it well. Uh, but I, you can't abrogate the responsibility for Eisenhower either. He signed off on it. But, but, but he later on asked Dulles if we couldn't have done it in a very different fashion. But Dulles the next day says to some of his friends, he says, oh, we've made a great chess move here with Nasser, Nasser you know, and we put Nasser in a hell of a spot. Well, we know who was in a hell of a spot after the, uh, the, the uh, Suez Canal was uh, nationalized. So I try not to editorialize me in the book, but it seems to me evident that, that uh, Dulles' judgment was rather poor about this. And, and it was not handled well. And, and Dulles is a great public servant. You know, I don't, you know, on one hand, historians have, have said for so long Dulles ran foreign policy and Eisenhower didn't. That's false. Having said that, it doesn't mean he wasn't a great public servant. He was a great partner for Eisenhower. And when, what part of the story is Ike is sick twice over long periods of time when he's not engaged. And Dulles doesn't do real well without Ike holding his hand. And, and consulting with him. And so I don't think he comes out well on that. No. Dave, thanks so much for coming to the Dole Institute. Thank you.